when we talk about in that last time, in that last time, and we're in that last time, we're in those last days, we're in those last days of the church age. And as it's a very short epistle, of course, just one chapter, 25 verses. We'll not read it in its entirety. I'm sure Jude is a book that you are familiar with. Um, Jude, we believe to be a half-brother to the Lord, the brother of James, we believe to be another half-brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. His own brothers thought he was mad, remember, at the time Christ was on earth. Yet they found the truth afterwards, or some of them did, not all. If you're in Jude, let's just go from verse number 17, the conclusion of the epistle, <clears throat> and uh, then we'll give some comment. Jude, verse number 17, but beloved. Now that's a, an instruction that's kind of in spite of, and despite everything that's gone before, but as a result of that, but beloved. Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you they should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> and we'll end our reading there this evening as we are reminded at the very end of that epistle. We're reminded of things that we need to be constantly reminded of, and that is to be faithful, particularly during times of apostasy and heresy and falling away. Let's just take a moment and pray on this thought tonight. In that last time, that's the title of the message, in that last time, it could just as easily be. Let's just take verse number 18, how they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own last. In the last time we have a description, but we could have easily have told, titled this message tonight, we've been told. We have been told. We are not in ignorance. But let's pray and ask the Lord to help us with this tonight. Our Father, dear God, we do thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and your wonderful promises. Our Lord, as we gather around your word tonight, we... In ignorance, we read your word. If we read your revelation to us, we are not ignorant to the ways of the world. We are not ignorant to the times and the seasons. We are not ignorant to the wiles of the devil. We have been told exactly what it will be like in this last time. And our Heavenly Father, we need to have clarity of understanding. Because, Lord, so often as Christians, we're looking for something that we've been told will not be there. And we're not seeing that which we have been told shall be there. And therefore, confusion abounds, hurt, harm, falling away. Christians being pulled to the world, seduced. And we're reminded of the need to be strong and the need to contend for the faith. Father, help us to remember that we are in that last time of the church age. And we need to be aware of exactly what it looks like and who we need to be. Lord, help us to be strong. Help us to be uh, standing upon the promises of truth, but also uplifted and strengthened by your word, that we may indeed stand. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Jude, of course... Um, has these wonderful opening verses and passages and, and verses, but <clears throat> the, 
The reason for it being written is quite simply uh, in verse number three, if we just look at that, it's beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. So common not meaning that it was happening all over the place, meaning the same true salvation that all Christians everywhere through all ages have received, i.e. those that have been saved by believing the gospel of the grace of God, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So giving diligence to write unto us of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's been delivered, it's set, it's settled once. Contend for the faith. That's uh, quite interesting topically, isn't it? As uh, King, King Charles III wants to be a defender of faith. But of course, he's supposed to be a defender of the faith. And we find how, once again, just the removal of one little word with three letters oh, yeah. makes all the difference. Defender of the faith, defender of faith means any faith you like, any faith you invent, any faith you claim as your own, and I'll be a defender of anybody who has faith in anything, which is a defender of nothing. But the title that is clear in his coronation position, he's supposed to be a defender of the faith. But we shall leave the world to the world. The Lord calls us now who are saved, who are recipients of the common salvation, who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we should earnestly, earnestly, seriously, fervently, never-endingly contend, stand for, that means, even fight for, it can mean, two boxers used to be called two contenders for the title, if they're fighting for a title belt. So it means to stand, it means to fight. For the faith, that is the way, that is the Christian faith, once delivered to the saints. And that is why the epistle was written. Okay, now I think we know that. I think we understand that. But the truth of it is, um, so we know that we need to be reminded of this truth because we are in these last times of the church age that the theme is contending for the faith in a world that is wicked, in a world that is sliding and slipping, in a world that is no fan of the faith anymore. But what we find here in the conclusion of the epistle, I believe, is, is how we contend for the faith and why we contend for the faith and for whom we contend. I think we see three things in here tonight. We see a reminder, we see a requirement, and we see a reason. Okay? We see a reminder, first of all. The reminder is we're reminded why we need to contend, and that's what reminded uh, to us in verses 17 to 19. But, beloved, now remember this talks not only about contending for the faith, it talks about contending for the faith because certain men crept in unawares, ungodly men, lasciviousness, and it goes through a terrible catalogue of disaster and it talks about, you know, the ungodly men with their ungodly ways and just all the ungodliness and wickedness and then goes, uh, I paraphrased it, shortened it and condensed it, but beloved. So now we switch back to the saved, to the saints, to, the, to the, 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 those in Christ, but beloved, those who are loved of God. And by the way, it's only the Christians that are loved of God in this church age. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not going to stray there, but there's, there's a misnomer out there that, you know, God present tense loves the world and loves the sinner. The Bible doesn't say that. It says God loved past tense. Those who are beloved, being loved by God in the present tense are those who are God's children that we looked at this morning, those accepted in the beloved. But beloved, remember ye the words. Remember ye the words. We are, we are being given a reminder that we need to remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were we there? We were not. How can we remember something that we weren't there for? Where are those words of the apostles? Where are they? 
Well, granted, you could ask many a Christian that question, and they couldn't answer it. And so, well, we know what God's word is. But we're called to remember the words, plural. And that's important, isn't it? Because God doesn't want us to remember a generalism. God wants us to remember some things specifically, some things that are specifically for this last time, and some things that were specifically said by the apostles who walked with Christ and went into the first century church. Now, I don't know what their words were if I wasn't there unless those actual words have been recorded, kept, inspired, and preserved, and are actually the words that I need to remember. Would God tell me to do something that I can't do? And this is important. There's a great distinction between the word and words. <coughs> very, very important. So we're reminded there are some specific and particular words that we need to read. Why? Because they tell us that in the last time, there will be people who are making a mockery of true Christianity. People who are walking after their own ungodly lusts. People who will separate themselves away from true Christians, very sensual, having not the spirit, it says. Notice the cap it less. So these will be people that have not the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we, we can cut to the chase there. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God, you're not saved. There is no Christianity where you can be a Christian and not have the Spirit and then wrestle with God for the second blessing and get the Holy Spirit. So in, in, in one sense, you become a Christian without the Spirit of God, and then if you do some wrestling or something, you get the second blessing of the Spirit of God. When you're saved, you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. So this is talking about some people who are not saved, but the inference is, for a season at least, they've been among the saved. They've been around the saved. So this is important. Now, now you may say to me, well, Pastor, you know, that, that says about in the last time. How do we know we're in the last time? Turn with me, not for the first time, but just in case, it would be remiss of me not to mention and give you the verse. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 2. This is how I can be certain we're in the last time. And you may say, well, 2,000 years ago, people thought we were in the last time. They were right. We were. And we've been in the last time for 2,000 years so far. You say, well, Jesus hasn't come yet. Well, then how much closer is it? Now, look at this. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners different times, different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these, note the present tense writing, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he hath made the world. So note, note the connection. When Jesus spoke, that's the marker that it was the last days. So for 2,000 years, the entirety of the church age, we have been in the last days. And so the Bible says we are in the last days. And we have been in them for 2,000 years. So we're in them, but we can draw some signs of the times and some prophetical inferences, and we can say we are very much more at the very end of the last of those last days. But this is written, beloved, remember you the words which were spoken, how that they told you they should be mockers in the last time. We're in the last time. So this is for us. We are reminded that we need to contend for the faith because these are the last days and there is a problem in the last days. And we're told to remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Peter. Was Peter an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Did he, did he speak? Yes, he did. Did God inspire him to write some words as one of the apostles who was with the Lord Jesus Christ in relation to this? Yes, he did. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 
First Peter chapter three. <clears throat> No, I don't want first Peter chapter three. You know, I thought that as soon as I said it. I'm thinking that's to do with the wives. Is it second Peter chapter three that I want? Just go with me a minute. Yes, second Peter chapter three. Thank you. Second Peter chapter three, verses one to four. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. So now we're dealing with the words. Not the general thoughts or themes or the fundamentals. We're dealing with the words of an apostle who was there with Christ, who we are told that we need to remember what he said. So the command in Jude can only be obeyed if we actually have the words, every single one of them, that God chose for us to have. And I have them. I can't speak for you, but I have them. Mm -hmm. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up, notice this, your pure minds. Stir up your pure minds. By way of, here it is again, remembrance. Jude says there are some things that we need to remember, and the things that we need to remember are things that were spoken by the apostles who walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we get to the words of the apostle who spoke with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ and walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, uh, there are some things that our pure minds need to remember. Verse number two, that ye may be mindful of the words. We have to fill our mind with the words of God, not the word of God. The words of God. Do you have them? Again, because it's not uncommon for many Christians to think they don't have the words of God. They have the word of God, but not the words. It's an interesting distinction because I do wonder how you can have the word of God without the words of God. But nonetheless. So we're to have our pure minds stirred up so that we can have a mind full of the words which was spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that they shall come in the last days. Here we are again. Scoffers. That's the same as mockers. It was scoff. Mock. Satirize. Ridicule. Kind of all means roughly the same thing. Knowing this verse, that they shall come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts. So we're told some things. Firstly, one, we need to be reminded of some things regularly. We need to be reminded of some things, particularly in the last times. We find from the words of God we are in the last times, and we find the things that we need to be reminded of, that in those last times, we will be assaulted, assailed, and around people who are mockers and scoffers of the words of God, who walk after their own lusts and their own desires and their own ways. Now you can say, yeah, that happens out there in the world. You know, what I see it happen to Christians. They just do what they want to do. So why is that? Well, we could go into a lot of detailed reasons why it is, but let me give you a biblical reason, because we're in the last times, and they're not being reminded to read and believe the words of God. They're not doing it. They warn us about these things exactly. First Timothy uh, 4, First Timothy 4. <clears throat> we're just getting a picture of what it looks like. <clears throat> A reminder of what we need to be aware of. First Timothy 4, verse number 1. Now the Spirit, capital S again, Holy Spirit of God, speaketh expressly. How does the Holy Spirit of God speak to you and I? Some kind of audible voice in the middle of the night when you're in the dark of your bedroom? The Holy Spirit speaks through the book that the Holy Spirit wrote, which contains both the Word and the words of the living God. And if they're God's words, they have to be perfect words because God does nothing imperfectly. And God says we're to stir up our pure minds 
by the words that were spoken, so they must be pure words to stir up our pure minds. You see how all these pieces fit together? It's not that difficult, is it? The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, there we are again, pay attention, it's talking to us. Some shall depart from the faith. Now, we know enough of the doctrine of the New Testament church that you can depart from the faith all you like, but the faith won't depart from you. So we're showing something here. Now, we, we saw there in, in, in Jude, we saw there in First Peter, there will be some who do not have the Holy Spirit of God, i.e. they are not saved. But we also have a warning that in these last times, there will be some who are saved, but yet they will depart from the path of truth. Why? Giving heed, attention, time, hearing to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then it goes on there to describe some of the elements we find primarily in the Roman Catholic Church. But I don't want to get sidetracked into that tonight. God says the reason we have to be reminded is because we forget some things. And what we have to be reminded of is our minds need to be pure and our minds need to be fed upon the words that were actually spoken to remind us that in the last times, a lot of people, and it's many, if you read through First and Second Timothy, the few become, some become the many, will be deceived and seduced. That's an interesting word, isn't it? Seduced. Seductively tempted from the truth and the true path and the true line of the faith as saved people to go the wrong way and after the wrong things. Ultimately, following seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils. Second Timothy chapter 3. What's this? These are reminders. That says we need to be reminded. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This know also that in the last days, what days are we in? We're in the last days. How do we know that? Because I watch the news? Because I'm a prophecy buff? No, because the Bible tells me straightforwardly we're in the last days. This know also that in the last days... Perilous times shall come. Four. It's a description of how we'll know what they look like. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Coaches, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to, to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Do you, do you see that? This is talking about the saved. It doesn't say lovers of pleasure because they don't love God. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. See, they do love God, but not as much as they love their pleasure. So what's that? It's a mark of the end times church, the Laodicean church that breathes apostasy, heresy, and falling away from lily-livered, seducing, contemporary Christianity. That seduces naive people who don't read the words of God into believing that you can have your cake and eat it. God says, no, you can't. You've been seduced by those who speak lies in hypocrisy. Having a form of godliness, verse number five says, having a form of godliness. Back when I were talking about this this afternoon. Nice people. Nice Christians. That's what this passage is telling us. Yeah, there'll be nice Christians that just happen to love the pleasures of the world a bit more than they love God. They've got a form of godliness. I mean, they'll have a meeting or two. They'll open a Bible-ish or two. They'll share a word or two. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. What does God say? We need to be reminded of these things. What is he telling us? There will be non-spirit possessors who profess to be possessors. He says you're going to have unsaved people. 
First and foremost, in your churches, you're going to have them. But he said also, you're going to have saved people who are seduced. And between the unsaved who pretend to be saved, the saved who behave like they're unsaved, between the two of them combined, their behaviour and doctrine will be seductive to Christians who happen to have a carnal or a naive or an unbiblical nature. And they will lead the stampede to the door and leave the Bible behind because after all, we don't have the actual words of God. We only have the word of God and that word of God is now being produced and preached in a seductive, lying way that says, head for the doors, head for the hills, love pleasure, love God, just love your pleasure more than you love God, but we'll have a form of God. See how this thing goes. And God says, in the last time, we need to be reminded of that. You know why? Because we've got to sleep on the job. The sad biblical truth, Luna and I were talking about this this morning, the sad truth is that we actually need to be reminded of this. I mean, it's just blind in the obvious. But God knows us better than we know ourselves, and what we take to be blind in the obvious, God says you're all asleep on the job and you need to be reminded of it. And that's what Jude is doing to us, for us, as is Peter, as is Paul, who was one of those apostles, remember the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the words Peter wrote. Jude says, I wasn't an apostle, but I'm writing telling you you need to remember. What you need to remember is what Peter wrote. What you need to remember is what Paul wrote. You need to remember. And it's sad that we need to be reminded of what ought to be really kind of obvious. Jude says we need to remind us, second, he said, then there's a requirement. We need to be reminded why we need to contend for the faith, because the world lies in wickedness. In Christians, many are sliding that direction with a form of godliness. We're reminded of that. What's the requirement? Okay, we need to contend for the faith. We're reminded why we need to contend for the faith. The requirement is how. How do we prepare to contend for the faith? Now, that is given to us. Again in Jude, from verse number 20, but ye beloved, okay, so we've got another but. So, but beloved, remember this, recognize that about this worldliness, but ye, he swings back to those who are faithful, those who are true, those who want to take a stand for the Lord and a stand for the faith and contend for the faith, but ye beloved, building up yourselves. Now, we've actually got seven things listed here, but ye beloved, building up yourselves, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Those are seven preparations that we need to do, and I would suggest on a daily basis to be prepared to contend for the faith. Building up, praying, keeping yourselves, looking, caring, warning, hating. Hating sin, by the way, not people. What does it start with? Building up yourself on your most holy faith. Why do we need to build up? Because it's really easy to tear down. Right? It's harder to build something than it is to break it. Anybody do airfix models when they were a kid? Remember those? The old airfix models? And you say, you know, you've got to break every single part of the thing and lay them all out and rub down all the rough bits and get your glues laid out and meticulously spend your time meticulously putting it all together bit by bit, part by part, wheel by wheel, leg by leg, body by body, wing by wing, propeller by propeller. Then you let all the glue dry. Then you get out your little pots of, uh, what was that paint called? Umbrol, umbrol, something like that. Those little pots of paint. I can't remember. You know, your green and your blacks and your camouflage colour and your paint on your camouflage pattern. You'd leave that to dry. And then you'd get, you know, you get some, like, cotton and you used to, like, like throw it around the w- wings. I mean, I'm going back in time now. You, the rest of you with your, your TikTok generation, no idea. Press the button, scroll, scroll, brain in neutral. We made things. And then you get your cotton, you'd hang it up on your bedroom ceiling, wouldn't you? And there'd be like, like Lancaster bombers and Spitfires all over the city, ships and tanks. And 
Oh, and you get to flex it. You know, one day you'd take some down and you'd be playing, flying a few and whatever. And, and mum would say, you know, your dinner's ready. Come on down. And down you'd go. And you'd go back in through the door of your bedroom and forget it was there. Crunch. Splat. That took like a nanosecond, didn't it? And it was just reduced to a pile of plastic rubble. You may have spent days building it up. One size nine in a second, it's just flattened and no use for anything but the bin. See, it takes time to build something. There's seconds to tear something down. And God says, we need to spend the time building up ourselves on the most holy faith. You know, you think, think building up, think about a bodybuilder. What are they going to put some fuel in, right? I'm going to spend the time down the gym and pumping the weights and building and blowing and we'll, we'll forget about the steroid element and all the rest of it for now. But they got to, you know, they're packing thousands of calories of food. They've got to get that food in and it's, you know, quality food. You know, it's, it's, it's like, Neil, no, no junk food. I mean, he gets the clean food, right? But cuts the good stuff in his body to build it up. Now, God takes that same picture and says, we've got to build up ourselves. He says, you need some good, clean food for your pure mind. What is that? Go to Job, Job 23. What do we need to build ourselves up on the most holy faith? We need some good food. We need some clean food. Some pure food, if you will. Job 23. Again, we find the same link. What is it that's going to build us up, strengthen us, prepare us to contend for the faith? Job 23, verse number 11. This is Job's conversation in reference to him and God. My foot hath held his steps. So the mine is Job, the his is God. Job 23, verse 11. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. I've gone the right direction. I've gone the right way. I haven't slipped back. I'm following God. Neither have I gone back from him. the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed, counted valuable, counted worthy, the words of his mouth, God's words, there we are again. Not the general fundamentals of what he thinks God was trying to say. God's actual words, the words of his mouth, more than my necessary food. Job said to be built up, to live the life that the Lord would have me to live. It was a eating more than my calorific intake. There was something that was more necessary than my necessary food. The food of God's actual words. How do you build yourself up on the most holy faith? On the words of the living God. Do you have them? I do. I hope you do. But that takes time, doesn't it? Just like the old ethics model all over again. It takes time to open the pages of Scripture. It takes time to feed on the words of God. Everything worth building takes time. We need to spend time in God's Word. Now, I'm not going to outline such time in all seven of these tonight. We would be here all night. Building up, being built on the words of the living God to stir up our pure minds. We would need the pure words of God, which thankfully God says we can have and have got, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, that we have those pure words. And they're the words that we call to read. And therefore we have them. They're there to read, but we must read them to build ourselves up. And that takes time. Praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost. I could preach a sermon on that tonight. Praying in the Holy Ghost does not mean praying in unintelligible gibberish like some kind of fanatical mad showman prancing around. I won't go any further with that tonight. Praying in the Holy Ghost, because quite actually, just go there. Just go to um, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll just show you what that is. I'm sure you know. I'm probably teaching the choir. I'm sure you're preaching to the choir. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. <clears throat> Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. <clears throat> for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart 
hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Friends, the Bible with the Bible, Scripture with Scripture, praying in the Holy Ghost, firstly, is silent. Grace which cannot be uttered. It's the time when God says, you don't even know or you're not even able to pray, but within you, say, child of God, lives God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit perfects that prayer that we in our infirmities and our weakness cannot make. And silent, groanings which cannot be uttered. God the Holy Spirit delivers that perfected prayer. You, you ever prayed and thought, what? Sometimes you've ever prayed out loud, even at home or in a prayer meeting, you just thought, what, what a rambling bunch of I, I couldn't quite couldn't quite articulate what I wanted to say. You know, I didn't quite get that prayer out the way it was. That's all right. That's not what God gets. God gets the perfected, edited version that the Holy Spirit of God puts down at the throne of grace. He said, this is what he was trying to say. This is what he meant. He searches what God the Father would have. That, that's praying in the Holy Ghost. It's the... God the Holy Ghost actually perfecting the prayer, actually pulling out from us what we really want to say that the Father knows we need. Living up, building up, praying, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Now, let me just say this in there. Can you lose your salvation? I'm looking at the crowd here tonight. I don't need to teach on this. You can't lose your salvation. Keeping yourself in the love of God. Don't read things into the scripture that aren't there. That doesn't say keeping yourself saved, does it? Now, in one sense, can we ever get out of the love of God because we're accepted in the beloved? No, we can't because we mentioned that this morning. It just means keeping yourself right there in the center of God's love. It means keeping close to God. Because we have the choice, don't we, whether we start wandering off the path a little bit and become a wandering sheep. And God says, keep yourself right there in the center of my will, in the center of my love. Bring yourself back. God, you right in the center of God's will. If we're contending for the faith right in the left field, you know, that's that's like putting a soldier on the field that's fighting for another army. You know, the, the, if, if you, you know, if you've got an army and you're fighting for your homeland and you put a foreigner in the army and the fighting gets tough, you'll be fighting because you're fighting for your homeland, but this foreigner, he'll be gone. He got no vested interest, right? And that's what it is about keeping ourselves in the love of God, keeping close to God, because when we're contending for the faith, when we're contending for God's faith, if we're right over there in left field, we don't even know if we're in the love of God or the will of God, we don't know where we are. When it gets tough, you'll turn for the hills and run. You can't contend for the faith if you're not even settled in the faith. Building up, praying, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking, watching, praying, looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking for him coming back for his people. Looking for the rapture. Looking for the blessed hope each day. Looking. But look at this next one. I have some verse number 22 of some of compassion making a difference. Caring. Let me contrast this with the other one. Some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's the contrast between caring and warning. What's that? That's the two sides of reaching people for Christ in the gospel. Some people need to know how much you care before they care how much you know. That's that old statement, right? Some people are one to Christ with care and with compassion and with time and with investment and with love, and you can put the gospel in because they know that you care for them. Some people are one to Christ that way. Not all. Some, it says, others save with fear. Others need to be warned. Others need to hear of sin and judgment and hell. It's that old phrase, isn't it? It's better to be hell scared than hell scorched. So some are one to Christ with care and compassion. Some are one Christ with the very fear of God put into them. So what's that that's contending for the faith? That's being prepared for both. It's not good giving a hell scorching to somebody who needs to have some compassion. 
And it's not good throwing compassion on somebody who needs a hell scorching. Right? A hardened heart needs a sledgehammer. A broken heart, smoking flax, you will not quench. Bruised weed, you shall not break. They need the balm of Gilead. And we've got to be prepared and wise enough to know the difference between the two. So what's that? So we can do the faith. And lastly, the seven requirements for building up hating. Look at this where it finishes. <clears throat> the end of verse 22, uh, 23, sorry. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now that's a picture of a leprous garment. A garment spotted by the flesh. The leprous garment of the Old Testament times. Well, and the times when Christ was on the earth and healed the lepers. But sin is, uh, sorry, leprosy is a picture of what also sin in the Bible so the garment spotted by the flesh is representative of leprosy, which is representative of sin. Hating the garment spotted by the flesh, not the flesh that spotted the garment. You see the difference? We're to hate the sin. Hate the sin. As Christians, we need to be reminded that in these Laodicean last times, where many Christians are seduced by lying spirits, that we are to be built up and ready and prepared to contend for the faith. And one of the greatest things we need to have is a hatred of sin in our life and the world. We are not to be comfortable ever with sin because Christ died for the sin of the world. Your sins and my sins. This is how we prepare to contend for the faith. This is how we overcome the world, the flesh and the devil in our own life. Friends, you can't contend for the faith if you don't run through those seven steps. Get yourself trained up, prepared, ready to go. You won't be able to do it. We're given the reminder why we need to contend. We're given the requirement how we prepare to contend. And lastly, we're given the reason for whom we contend. Follow it through with me now, verse number 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. We don't contend for the faith so that we can prove that we're right. We don't contend for the faith so we can prove prove we're the Bible champion today. I'm the smartest Bible believer in town. <laughs> Pull out the verse. Pulled out the doctrine. Contended. Boom, boom. Shot another two Christians today. That's not who we're contending with, and that's not how we are to contend. It's not to prove smart puffed up, bloated Bible believers we are. It's actually contend, to contend for the faith, to show the world that there is a true faith and to show the Christians who have been seduced by lying spirits that that is not the direction to go in, that in these last times we need to be aware of those things. And the reason is because we're contending for the glory of God. For the only wise God, our Saviour, we're contending for the glory of God and for the majesty of God. Why? Because God's not capable of doing that for himself. Absolutely not. Of course he is. But he has deigned and planned to use us. God could contend for the faith in five minutes and smatter the world and say, take that. But he said, my ambassadors... You go forth and you contend for the faith. Knowing why you contend, how to contend, and for whom we contend. With our eyes on glory. Not ours, but God's. I mentioned the verse this morning. Let's finish with it tonight since we're almost there. Revelation 4 and verse number 11. We contend for the glory and the majesty of God. We're not like those Christian debaters. I've never yet seen a Christian debate that did anything except prove both people thought they were even more right at the end of it. 
I'd love to watch one one day where somebody went, that was an argument, I'm convinced, I'm changing my opinion. It must happen, I've just never seen it. We don't contend to be right, we contend for God, for the faith. Look at Revelation 4.11, thou art worthy, worth it. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, that includes us, doesn't it? And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. We weren't even created for ourselves. We were created for God's pleasure and for God's glory. And now as the new creation, as the new creatures in Christ, we are sent out to contend for the faith, not to prove how smart we are, not to prove how clever we are, to contend for the faith to demonstrate whose we are and his glory and his majesty and his dominion and his power. And God says, in the last times, I will need to keep reminding you of that. Because quite frankly, what do we know to be an imperial truth? Most Christians in the last days are living for themselves. Living for pleasure, living for passion, living for ease, comfort, simplicity. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. God's remind us we need to get that balance right. We're created for his glory. It doesn't say we can't have any pleasure. But let's not confuse pleasure and sin. But the balance must be lovers of God more than lovers of pleasure. That's how we contend for the fame. We have been told, and we need to be reminded, because we need to know we are in the last times, and we keep falling asleep. And God said, it's high time to awake, for now is your salvation nearer. Now we're closer to the blessed hope. Now we're closer to the trump. Now we're closer to Christ coming for his people. Now is the time that we must stand and we must labor, we must work, and we must pray, and we must take the gospel out to the lost, but we must try and hang on also to this naive, sleeping Christians who are being seduced by lying, hypocritical spirits, and by unsafe people masquerading as Christians. And they're slipping away from the truth into the world. And they think it's okay. God says, let me remind you, it is not. Contend for the faith and be prepared and planned how to do so. God says, let me remind you. I pray that we are reminded of how to do it and why we do it and for whom we do it. May God help us to be strengthened for these days. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your words. We thank you above all for our great Saviour, Jesus Christ. Our great Shepherd, Lord, may we not wander from the fold. Father, keep us safe. Set a wall and a hedge of protection around us. Our dear God, may we just snatch snatch back those who are straying. Dear God, we pray by your Holy Spirit, you bring conviction and strengthening upon us. Lord, may we realize that Satan will use the nice to bring down the best. Oh God, may our eyes be wide open. May we tread our path with caution. Help us, dear God, in these days to be ready, prepared, and understanding how, why, what, and wherefore are we to contend for the faith. Let us under sleepwalking and to step in away apostasy and heresy. Let us not take the path of liberality. All things, Lord, are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Let us be reminded of that. And that's what you call us to. Father, I pray your word has course and free reign tonight. I pray. Dear God, you strengthen your people through your word, not mine. In Jesus' holy name.